So next up, we have a talk by Kurian about demystifying async and await keywords in Python and JavaScript. Over to you, Kurian. Thank you, Bhavin. Am I audible? Yep, loud and clear. I hope yes. Uh, so uh, today I will be talking about async and await, which is a way to write concurrent code in both languages like Python, JavaScript, and a few more languages. It's a foundation for multiple asynchronous frameworks that provide high performance and network high performance for network and web servers. So during this talk, we will be covering what is the fundamental concept behind async and await. Also, we will be looking about what is async await and how we can write concurrent code in the context of both Python and JavaScript. Also, we will be looking what are the applications and what are some of the potential mistakes which you can make as a beginner when you are writing async and await code. So a bit about myself, I'm uh, myself as Bhavan introduced, I'm Korean and I'm working as a software engineer come data scientist at AOT Technologies, building Formsflow AI, an open source solution. I'm an open source enthusiast and Python is the language which got me into programming. So if you are interested to follow along with the slides, uh, you can check the link bit.ly slash async hyphen await hyphen Python. So the first time I used the keywords async and await, I was confused. I asked the people near me, what does this keyword async and await, which is so unpythonic doing? And they told me it was used to improve the speed of the program. Hmm, interesting. I thought, and I started looking more and more about it. Once I started looking more and more, I got confused and I got into jargons like, even loops, tasks, promises, callbacks, and a lot more. If you're attending this talk, I am assuming you are also confused by asynchronous programming in both Python and JavaScript. So with this talk, we will be demystifying it one by one. So let's understand the fundamental concept of async and await with each example. So I hope you know the person in the picture. This is Vishwanathan Anand, the five time world champion and India's still India's best player. Assume, assume that we are organizing a chess simul with 24 opponents and each of the opponent is rated with less than 1500 yellow point, which is a chess rating system. So usually 1500 yellow point players are having one, one years of experience and they have been playing, they are relatively new to the game. And assume that each game is ending in 30 moves. And since Anand is an experienced player, he is moving in five seconds while the opponent, since they are uh, he, she, he or she may be a uh, low, uh, small, uh, low rated player, will take uh, 55 seconds to make him. So assume that if Anand was playing the game, one player like it at a time in the Simon, just like a normal chess game. So the one game will take approximately 30 minutes and almost 24 games will take 24 into 30 minutes. That is equal to 12 hours to complete. Usually chess simuls are not run that way. In a real chess simul, it is usually asynchronous. So what usually happens is like Anand will make the first move, then he will move on to the second board and to the corresponding boards. So as a result, um, Anand is able to complete uh, play all the 24 opponents in two minutes the first time. After that, by that time, the opponent will be the first opponent will be ready for the move. So, by this method, we are able to complete the entire set of game in one hour. Because if we are playing thirty moves, thirty into two minutes per each round, when we are playing twenty four opponents, we will get we will be able to complete in one hour. So, if you look at look this compared to our uh, asyn uh, synchronous chess simul example, uh, you know we are almost twelve x faster with this approach. So if you are looking at the bottleneck in the chess simul example, you will see that our bottleneck was to utilize Anand to his fullest potential. In the synchronous chess simul example, we were not utilizing him fully, but in the asynchronous chess simul example, since he is playing um, one player at a time, uh, not playing uh, from one player, he is moving on to the another player, he is playing very quickly. So such a problem in computer science is called input output bond problem. It refers to the time if it if the time if more time is spent for waiting rather than actually processing it. Uh, such a problems are called uh, input output bound problems. 
so in computer so we usually have a solution for this that is used by using concurrency so using concurrency we are able to run different parts of the program or algorithm to be executed in the same time or out of order so this is like a person juggling in this picture uh, now assume that if we are organizing a different kind of a chess assignment this time we are not having the normal players but we are having grandmasters who are almost of the same level like Vishwanath Anand. They have been playing the game for years. So Vishwanath Anand is not able to play as quickly as he used to be playing with the low rated opponents. So what can we do? Uh, what can we do? A hypothetical situation which can be shown as shown in this picture will be to have add more and more Anands. And if more and more Anands are there, we can obviously play uh, uh, the game faster. I know this is not possible in the real world, but for computers, most of the computers are having multiple cores. Uh, so with um, octa cores and hexa cores, we are able to run our program in all the uh, all the cores, and we are able to run multiple tasks at the time. So what is the difference between concurrency and parallelism? So concurrency can be defined as a way to run multiple tasks in with an ability to run it in overlapping manner, while parallelism is when tasks are executed at the same instant. So one is about the structure and the other is about the execution. Um, if you are interested to learn more, uh, I would highly recommend you to check out the first API docs on asynchronous, asynchronicity. And you may be thinking which is better, whether we should use concurrency for all our problems or parallelism for all our problems. It depends on the task which you are doing. So that documentation will give you a good idea about it. So what is the keywords async and await? So I will like to define it from a layman's perspective for our sake of discussion as async is a way to write concurrent code and await can be used to train. All the code can't be running concurrently, right? Some code need to wait and uh, so that such code to have a waiting condition, we are using the await keyword. So you may have been guessing why I am talking async and await in the context of both Python and JavaScript. So uh, according to 2020 JetBrains survey, if you look at the Python usage with other languages, then JavaScript is the most commonly used language with Python among the developer community. So that's why I, have, I am talking about the Python's usage um, with JavaScript in the stuff. So now let's look at the uh, look at a synchronous program and let's see how we can make it faster with an asynchronous programming uh, asynchronous programming in Python. So you can see this piece of code snippet. So you can see that we have a greet after function. What the greet after function is doing is uh, it is um, having it. Uh, it is uh, we are passing a delay and it is uh, sleeping for one second. After that, we are greeting the corresponding person with hello, person name, and with a uh, waving hand emoji. So you can see that in our main function, we have called the greet after function. So we are greeting Guido and uh, Sebastian. So if you are looking at the uh, output, you can see that how the output is coming as expected. So first, uh, we are greeting Guido and Rosam with three seconds delay followed by Sebastian Ramirez with two seconds delay and Luciano Ramelo with one second delay. And the program is taking six seconds to execute. So if you want to visualize how it is really happening, uh, we had three functions and function one took a long time and the uh, function two also, uh, function two had two seconds delay. So since the program was running synchronously, uh, we, you can see that uh, response two, even though it was it was having a small delay, it had to wait for a long time, and even response three also had to wait for a long time before it was being executed. So uh, you may be thinking how we can improve the performance, like in case of the chess Simon example with Anand, when we played asynchronously, we were able to get a twelve x improvement, right? So. There are mainly two ways to implement concurrency in CPython. It is using threading library and using the async IO module. So if you look at the threading module, Python threads are implemented internally using the operating system threads. And um, in CPython, uh, due to the global interrupter, uh, global interrupter lock, only one thread can be executed so that uh, Python code can be run only at once. 
so it's only it's highly suitable for its training library is suitable for input output concurrency so let's look at a sample code to see how we can do the same uh, same code um, concurrently so if you see that we are importing the threading module and after that we are using the threading dot thread module and we have we are having we are passing that target and finally you are starting all the thread with thread dot start module thread dot start function so i guess you may have uh, estimated this output so first we are greeting luciano ramaldo even though it was coming at the third position uh, since luciano ramaldo has the least time delay um, it is being printed first followed by we are greeting sebastian ramirez with a time delay of 2 seconds and finally we are greeting guido vendrosa with a time delay of 3 seconds so to visualize the program outflow, you can check how it is. So we had three requests here as well. And in function one, we were executing our program with a time delay of three seconds, function two, two seconds. So in this case, uh, with asynchronousity, uh, with asynchronous execution, and when we are using concurrent, pro concurrent programming, you can see that yeah, once a function three is being completed, it's not waiting for anything. And it's not having the long time delay it had in the earlier case. So it's able to be executed right after uh, with a one second delay. Uh, so it is, it is executing after some time uh, in one second, once the request has been started. And then we have we are getting the corresponding result for request response two and response one as well. So if you look at the Python's threading module, Python's threading module suffers some limitation. So uh, some of the limitations are since uh, threads threads are accessing the same shared state. So if both threads are accessing a same variable, then it can update the same values and it can cause a race condition. So that's bad for us. Uh, in order to avoid race conditions, some of the methods in threading, like you can use some of the methods in threading, like locks, etc. But uh, even then, also there are some limitations uh, with it, uh, like you know certain tasks may not be run in case of certain threads. So, in order to solve the problem of certain tasks not being able to be run. Uh, and to provide a standardized implementation of concurrency in CPython, uh, you know, the AsyncIO module was being introduced as part of CPython, um, I think uh, from the Python 3.4 onwards. And uh, with uh, AsyncIO module, you are, we are able to use, the, uh, use Python to uh, use cooperative multitasking to smartly run all the tasks and threads. It's using async and await syntax. So when we are looking at a single year module, we have mainly four important concepts to look at. Uh, one is the coroutines, other is the event loop, three is the task, and fourth is the futures. So let's look at it all. At, uh, let's look at it one by one. So a coroutine is a special function which can suspend and resume execution. They work like lightweight threads, and it's a type of special function uh, which is always being defined with the async def syntax. And only within a coroutine can we can use the awaitables uh, available in the asyncio function. Then there is the concept of event loops. So event loop is like an indefinite loop which calls all the registered coroutines in some order until they all terminate. So you know what event loop is doing is like it it is the real reason behind the you know our programs being uh, able to be run concurrently. So it's just a queue based on the coroutine function. Uh, if the if the corresponding functions, uh, you know, if the corresponding coroutines need to be switched away and all, uh, even loops are even loops are the real reason for this. And you can run even loops in C Python using the asyncio dot run module. And um, um, from Python three point seven onwards only it's applicable. And um, if you want to run, there is also something called UV loop, which is a production implementation of uh, um, the CPython implementation. And it's almost giving 8x improvement in the performance compared to the normal asyncio.uv loop. So if you are using something for the production, you definitely need to use uh, UV loops. Then there is a concept of task. So task schedules a coroutine in an event loop. And you can call the uh, wrap the coroutine to create a task with async.createTask method. 
and you can run multiple tasks together concurrently using the asyncio.data method so this is how um, this is uh, all about task and then there is another concept of futures so what futures is like uh, it's providing in asyncio uh, a framework which is available in multiple languages like in javascript where you know we have a uh, um, something to connect the producers and the consumers together and to wait it uh, and to wait for our execution to be completed so futures is something in the c python uh, which is in the asyncio module which is used to bridge the low level callback based code to the high level async and await code and it's uh, uh, providing the function of waiting so now it's an exciting moment for all of us because we are now using uh, the async and the await syntax for the first time uh, in our talk and you can see that we have used the async def main function uh, to create a coroutine and uh, we are using the task one task two and task three to the create the task and we are calling the greet after function which we had used uh, earlier the only difference with the, this time is we are using and uh, we are not using the time dot sleep method but we are using the sleep method in the async io itself uh, because the time uh, because certain libraries in uh, async io are not compatible with the synchronous code so you need to use asynchronous libraries for that then finally we are running all the three tasks concurrently uh, with the async io dot gather task and finally you are calling the uh, await uh, await to wait till all the tasks are being completed now in the main function uh, we are calling we are define uh, we are using the async io dot run function to run the uh, event loop and to run this coroutine so that we are able to uh, execute the coroutine function so now you can see that we are getting the results as expected we were, we are now greeting Luciano Ramaldo first and Sebastian Ramirez uh, second and Guido Van Rossum third. Uh, because even though they were, uh, and we are now able to run our program concurrently. So concurrently, now you can see that our program is ending in three seconds compared to six seconds. And it may not be, it's just a two expert improvement in performance, but you know, for any input out want problems, which, you know, which requires a lot of waiting, you know, it would be, uh, when we are using async IO, we are getting a huge performance boost. So now let's look at JavaScript and how we can implement um, um, some of the async and await syntax in JavaScript as well. So this is an example of a sample program in JavaScript. And you can see that uh, I don't think uh, you don't need to go into the details of the program, but we we are having we are finding the prime numbers of 1 million numbers, then followed by 1,000 and then 10. So obviously, since the program is being running in a sequential order, um, we are able to <clears throat> we are able to get the results only after a long time delay. Uh, so we need to wait for a lot. Let me have a sip of water. In, ja in JavaScript, there are mainly three ways to write concurrent code. So it can be done using the call, it can be done using callbacks, promises, and async and await syntax. So we will not be diving too much into the code for callbacks and promises. Uh, so in callbacks, callbacks is a way to <coughs> uh, call uh, invoke a function within another function. Uh, within the callbacks, if we are like writing our conditions properly, we are able to ensure that our code is running uh, asynchronously with callbacks but you know to program in pro callbacks it's difficult and now no one use callbacks because it's uh, you know uh, error handling is difficult and it and you may have heard about callback hells because you know in any program uh, the any part of the function that ever can happen and it's difficult to spot it off then there is the concept of promises so usually in promise, uh, usually in any kind of programming language, there are two types of code, one which is returning a result and another which is like producing the corresponding results. So promises are a way in JavaScript to link the prom producers and the consumers together. So it's like an email newsletter, which lets all the subscribers know when the result is ready for the consumption. And you can use the um, you, in promises. If you are using with a producer, you have the resolve and reject keywords to get the corresponding values 
and if you are um, using uh, <clears throat> if you are using uh, consumers you can use promise chaining with operators like then catch etc so now let's look at async and await syntax in case of javascript so under the hood actually async key async and await is being implemented with promises in javascript promises itself but it's a clean way to avoid the promise chaining um, promise chaining so what async keyword is actually providing is it is allowing a function to return a corresponding promise and also secondly it is um, uh, so it can either return a promise directly or inside it it can you call the awaitables like uh, awaitables what await keyword is actually doing is you can uh, return the result of the promise once it is being set in with the await, await keyword. So once a uh, um, a promise is being defined and if it is returning the promise only, the, so it is like an indicator like which we have uh, when we had discussed in the um, earlier condition initially in the layman's condition, or it can throw an error or an exception in key, when we are using await keyword. So um, now let's look at the sample code. Uh, so um, as an exercise for all of you, uh, you can read this code for five seconds and you can, can you uh, guess what the program will be printing after five seconds? Uh, you can comment in the chat box. So I hope you may have checked it out by now and got the answer. So we are having an async function called say hello here. And what the function is uh, doing is we are printing hello hello first and we are using a wait function and in the wait function what we are doing is we are uh, returning the corresponding uh, we are uh, uh, returning a promise with it so what the if you look at the promise it is having the resolve and reject keywords and inside it set there is a set timeout function so if you are new to javascript set timeout is a function which is like running uh, running minimum after four seconds and like if it is being ready uh, after running like it is going to print uh, after four seconds what it is it is actually a callback uh, we will look into it more detail in the coming slides and uh, after if after the wait function is being called you can call the console.log world to print the world function so I hope you all may have guessed the output like this way. So we are printing hello, hello, Pajana stars. Uh, thanks for waiting, uh, world. So you may be guessing why. So let me explain this uh, and why JavaScript is behaving like this um, with the slide from a wonderful talk by what the heck is when loop by Philip Roberts. So I highly recommend you to check it out after this talk because it's something, it's an amazing talk. Uh, I highly check and recommend you to check it out. So you can see the uh, source code. We are having, uh, we are taking the console.log high, then we are calling the corresponding set timeout function. And after that, we are calling jsconf u. And in the, so first we are going to the stack and printing high first. Uh, when when we are calling the set timeout function, uh, the set timeout function has been initially been going to the stack. Since uh, it is calling a callback, which needs to be waited for five seconds, it's going to the corresponding queues. By the same time, by that time, you can see that JSConf view is being printed correspondingly since JavaScript in runtime is asynchronous in nature and uh, JavaScript like in web is asynchronous in nature or in even in Node.js also is asynchronous in nature. So JSConf view is also printed. And after five seconds, even loop is like, printing the corresponding result of the task queue. And after five seconds, it's being pushed to the stack and we are getting the corresponding message with log there. So this is how with uh, with, the with the concept of event loops and using stacks and queues, JavaScript is able to run asynchronously in the runtime. So I hope you all got it. Uh, so just to summarize what we have discussed so far, we have discussed that we can run uh, concurrent code uh, in both Python and JavaScript uh, using threading and asyncio. So I think this table uh, summarizes everything perfectly well. So now let's look where async and await is useful. So it's highly useful in case of massive scaling. So without burning your pockets, it's helpful to deal when you have a lot of users and you want to scale, uh, scale compared to other approaches like threading or multiprocessing. And it's used to build high performance web frameworks dealing with a lot of input output operations. Like
uh, KPI, Tornado, AIOS, TTB, Coat, etc. So I hope you all have heard from Sebastian itself that like how useful um, a single IO function is, and you know the, with concurrency only they are able to get you know almost uh, great performance in fast API. So now let's look at some of the common mistakes which you are which we can make when as a beginner when we are using async and awake. I have made all these mistakes and so I guess it will be easy for all of you to not repeat these mistakes. Uh, so the first mistake can be, uh, you know, we have a function f and we are having a promise which is resolving uh, um, just a number and we are awaiting the result with that promise value. Uh, so if you run this program, you will see that you will get a syntax error. So the reason is because we are awaiting uh, without an async function. So, you know, any async, any, uh, if you, if you want to use awaitables, you need to always, uh, define it inside, inside an async function only like, uh, async, uh, await will be runnable. The next uh, common mistake which you can make when you're starting is using, uh, async function without, uh, coroutines. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, async is a, uh, async is a way to write coroutine, coroutines, but you know, we are not awaiting or anything. So. You know, in Python, this is uh, this is going to throw a syntax error. Uh, but um, and if you want to debug more, you can use the Python's uh, flags for async IO debugging. You know, just imagine this: like you async and await, like as a bullet for a bullet. And imagine that if you have a bullet and if you are just keeping it in your pouch instead of going for a write. This is the exact same scenario when you are using an async function without the awaitables or creating a corresponding task. So another common mistake is to write dropping code. So I'm, you can all, all check out this piece of code and can you guess what will the output be in this case? Let me have a sip of water. So you can see that we are calling task one, task two and task three and we are greeting and we are using the async keyword and we are using the wait to wait for something. And you know, we are uh, using async sleep as I promised earlier itself for running, implementing it concurrently. But you can see that this program is perfectly equivalent to our normal concurrent code. So this is why, uh, this is why it's very uh, common to, this is why it's, uh, some, it's something which we all make. And so you need to, uh, the mistake which we had here was, you know, we were awaiting all the time so that it's, it was executing synchronously instead of being running concurrently. So in order to fix that mistake, we could have used a gather method to run all these three stars concurrently. Uh, another mistake which we have made is like, you know, never run blocking code like read after function. It was waiting for 10 seconds. It is queuing up our queue, right? Like uh, our event loop queue, it's just queuing up. So uh, don't use uh, functions like that uh, in our code. Um, so um, with that, uh, I would like to conclude uh, by reminding you all of you to say that, you know, async and await is a great way to, you know, for input output bound calls, let it be any database calls, API, API servers, etc. And if you want to build a wonderful uh, web API frameworks, which where you have a lot of network latency, like web APIs with a lot of network latency, uh, async IO is, uh, you know, as any frameworks based on async and await is a good tool. Um, and in both Python and JavaScript, it is having the similar, uh, similar syntax. Yesterday, um, uh, Sebastian Rambras mentioned some wonderful people who are behind these frameworks. So I would like to thank all of them. Uh, so these are the wonderful people uh, behind implementing this, implementing this feature. And uh, I would like to share some reference as well. So I know a 30 minute talk is definitely not good enough to cover this talk. Uh, so if you want to implement, uh, look into more into it, like you can check out the MDN docs or async await in case of JavaScript. And in Python, if you are interested, you can check out the import async IO series in HDB by Lucas Lenga. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk by offering tributes to Arif Jamal. He was a open source contributor in uh, Forsythia, a wonderful human being. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and you can find the slides here. All right. Yep. Thank you, Varian.